Well, good morning and uh, welcome. We're glad you're here. And uh, this is the fourth Sunday of the Advent season. And I tell you, these candles just get lit faster and faster each year, I think, as we go from one to two. And all of a sudden, we're at four weeks. And then we have the Christ candle soon to uh, light on uh, Christmas Eve, this evening service, and on Tuesday. So we hope that you'll come and worship with us and invite others to join you as well. The birth of a baby is always welcome and exciting news. I mean, it's absolutely exhilarating. And around our house, it's been all baby all the time. And I want to just introduce you to my grandson. And here he is, who was born on the 11th. And um, what, a, what a shameless thing for a, for a grandparent to do. Just post him all the way up there and have you all enjoy him with me. But... Um, isn't he great? He's awesome. And um, so we're excited. Our oldest son, Ryan, and his wife, Rachel, had their little baby, Grayson Russell, on the 11th. And uh, so thank you for sharing our joy in that. And, you know, this is the season that we're all about babies. We're really all about one child who was extraordinary, who uh, lived a sinless life in our midst, who went to the cross not to bear the weight of sin he committed, but our sin. And then on the third day to rise again, that we would have a living hope through the resurrected Christ. He is extraordinary, and he is the source of exhilaration and joy. He is Christ, the King. And you might remember the angels announced great joy that would be for all the people. And I think this story today, as we look at the Magi, really emphasizes that second half. That the good news of Jesus Christ is for all the people. The arrival of the Magi, who, who traveled the equivalent distance of, say, Minneapolis to New York City, and they didn't do it in a Cadillac, they didn't do it in an SUV, they didn't do it by train. They went likely by camel. Tell me they didn't have a few bumps or humps along the way. And uh, they had a whole, it wasn't that terrible. That was a bad attempt. But I don't know when you have a flat tire on a camel what you call it. So, but they had their challenges along the way. They had to bring all of their supplies with them for a thousand mile trip. So it was likely a large entourage who traveled with them. Does that not demonstrate that God gives grace to all who seek him? Unlike Mary and Zechariah and Simeon, whom we've looked at the last three weeks, each of whom sang songs of exhilaration and blessing, the Magi appear largely silent. It seems they're the mysterious men from the east, kind of the strong, silent type. Although I suppose a case could be made that they were the first to sing the famous carol, We Three Kings of Orient Are, right? I think, though, the Magi are the most intriguing characters around the Christmas story. They captivate the imagination with their long flowing robes and their royal crowns and their extravagant gifts. Artists have been fascinated with the Magi for more than 2,000 years. According to art history, his, uh, historians, the adoration of the Magi appeared earlier and more frequently than any other scene associated with Jesus' birth. And by the 6th century, no nativity was complete without them. Down through the ages, fantastic tales and traditions had developed around these magi, these wise men, transforming and promoting them from wise men and stargazers to kings of great royalty from all points of the earth. It fascinates me how much has been made of the magi, when in fact, scripture records very little about them which seems a reminder to me that the purpose of the Bible and its story is not to make much about the characters surrounding Christmas, but to magnify Christ, who is Lord of all, the source of life and light and hope. And so we pick up the story in Matthew chapter 2. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to follow along, or in your teaching notes, you'll find the passage as well. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? 
We saw his star in the east when it rose and have come to worship him. Kind of interesting, who did they ask? You ever ask yourself that question? Just kind of shows up in the passage and they came and they asked. Well, who did they ask? Um, it seems that they just were raising questions and their presence created curiosity about why these foreigners from a thousand miles away would be in Jerusalem and, and their questioning began to kind of bubble up. Matthew records very little information about these seekers. No exact number is given, although we deduce there were perhaps three. We get that from the fact there were three gifts. But that's tradition and there's no biblical support around that, so we don't know. No names are mentioned, although tradition has identified the names, not only the names, but the bodies of these three wise men. In fact, you could go to the place where the remains of the three wise men are entombed. It's a shrine, but it's fascinating. And there are no hometowns or no distant countries identified. So what do we know about the Magi? Well, likely they were priests who lived in Persia, in modern-day Iran. I mean, hold on to that thought for a little bit. The first ones who came to seek the Christ child were from where? Persia, modern-day Iran. Is that not a picture of God's grace that extends to all nations and all peoples? And they were very educated. It's possible they may have been of a line of Persian priests influenced generations earlier by the prophet Daniel. And perhaps they were even proselytes of the Jewish faith because it seems that they had this long expected waiting for not just a king, but the king of the Jews. They're very specific in their questioning. So it seems these men were trained stargazers who discerned the birth of a Jewish king based upon the appearance of an unusual astronomical event. And while there's much that we don't know about the Magi, what we do know from Matthew's account, which I think is of most importance, is how these seekers responded to the light of God's love and grace in a dark, dark world. And so we're going to look at three responses to the star. We're going to consider Herod's response, the Jews' response, and then we'll look at, Ma at the Magi and their response to the birth of Christ. And as I read Matthew's account, it struck me that the appearance of the star itself seemed to raise very little curiosity among the citizens of Jerusalem, which kind of stood out to me that, you know, this brilliant star that we picture, it sure seems that it would have captured the attention of some who were in its vicinity. And yet they seem to be going about their daily lives as if nothing has changed or happened. And we'll talk about what may be causing that sense of there's just not much happening in Jerusalem except for life as usual. Rather, it was the entrance of these foreigners and their entourage and the politically incorrect nature of their question that, that starts to stir a response and a concern. The Magi made their way to Jerusalem, the capital city of Israel, I think expecting that to be the place where the king would be born, where there would be a buzz of excitement and enthusiasm to search for and to welcome the king of kings, the king of the Jews. And what did they encounter? Little to nothing, but life as usual. Notice the Magi didn't learn of the Christ child's birthplace, Bethlehem, until later. And so expecting to greet the new king, it made sense that they went immediately to the seat of power, namely Jerusalem. But when news of a rival king reached Herod, we experience Herod's response. Matthew records that Herod was defiant. Herod was defiant. Maybe more than defiant, he becomes violent in his reaction. You remember Simeon's song? Simeon's song near the end held a blessing. And in that song was a sword, a sign, and a stone. And Simeon predicted to Mary, the mother of Jesus, that this child who was born would be a sign to reveal the hearts and the thoughts of many who encountered him. 
And I think in this story of the Magi and Herod's response and the Jews' response, that prophecy, that blessing comes true. Because we start to see the heart exposed. We start to see the thoughts revealed. And Herod's thoughts were those of disturbing, violent hatred. Who was Herod? Well, for starters, he was not a Jew, but he was a descendant of Esau. After the death of Julius Caesar, he was appointed king of the Jews. As one historian comments, Herod will always stand as one of the most deplorable characters in the New Testament. He was a vicious ruler. He neither feared God nor had regard for others. The list of relatives, wives and sons, and close relatives that Herod felt threatened by who were executed under Herod's command is long. He had no regard for anyone but himself. You might say that Herod magnified no one other than Herod. He was not a God magnifier. He was a Herod magnifier. And in fact, Matthew recounts for us, as we know, Herod's uncontrolled rage when the Magi failed to return to uh, tell him of where the Christ child is born. And enraged, Herod commands the killing of all male infants under the age of two years old in absolute, undescribable horror. And so it's little wonder that Matthew records that when Herod was disturbed, all Jerusalem trembled. And I think about this, and I pull back from that and think, oh, the humility and the wonder of God's love, which stands in absolute stark contrast to the maniacal self-worship of Herod. I think to myself, why is it that God, who is the commander of all things and all nations and all armies, would not have come in a different manner to confront the hatred and the anger of Herod? That God would not come in awesome and terrible power to assert his rightful reign, but rather would choose to insert his son, king of the Jews, within the hostile territory of Herod, and to do so through the disarming presence of a child. Is that not a, a, an incredible thought? That, that God, in all his humility and wonder and love, came in the form of child. All for the sake of pouring out his grace upon those who would seek him. It's an absolute wonder. And verse 4 says that when Herod had called together all the people's chiefs and priests, teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they said, for this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be shepherd of my people Israel. One linguistic scholar suggests that the form of Herod's question may indicate that he was not expecting a response to his question. Which makes me wonder how surprised, how unsettled he may have been when the Jewish leaders responded so quickly and with pinpoint accuracy about the location of the Christ child's birth. I mean, they even quoted scripture to make their point. Their response is drawn largely from prophecies in Micah and in the book of Samuel. And so these Jewish teachers and these leaders of the law knew of the Messiah's predicted birthplace in Bethlehem. Doesn't it make you wonder why the inaction on their part? I mean, they're just a mere five miles distance from that location. So why their inaction? And why their unbelief? It's not explained on the basis of a lack of knowledge, is it? They're not ignorant to the truth. They didn't need to just read the Bible a little bit more in order to put in faith, put in practice what they already knew, to, to walk by faith and to check things out. And sometimes I think... I'm concerned that we think the solution to, to our challenges in life is if we could just get more knowledge. 
Well, well, here's a case of plenty of knowledge and little to no action, no trust. And there's a reason why, and we'll talk about that reason why, but it's concerning. When you think about the knowledge that we have, that they had, and yet their inaction, what explains that? Because in the end, they, they demonstrate this unbelief and, and they miss out on the Messiah's birth. They miss out on God's grace. The Jews' inaction suggests to me that they lived with a measure of denial in response to Herod's anger. And as a result, they froze. They were paralyzed. They, they wouldn't even travel the six miles to Bethlehem to welcome the one who was sent to save and deliver them. I would summarize the Jews' response as that of denial. You know, they had enough knowledge and truth, but they found a way to kind of keep it safely tucked away so it wouldn't disturb the peace. And so they ignored what they knew. What is clear is that Herod cast a long, dark shadow of fear over the land of Israel. And the Jews lived in this fear because they knew that he was intimidating and would force them into silent submission. Now, I take a deep breath around this and just walk with me a bit to present day situations because I wonder if some of us might identify a little bit with the Jews. Living in the long dark shadow of something or someone that we fear. And I suspect that there are more than a few who are seated in this room this morning living life under a cloud of uncertainty, afraid of something within or someone without. It may be the uncertainty of your health, emotionally, physically. It may be the condition of your marriage, and it's tenuous at best. It may be that your employment is in a really tough place. It may be that you know all too well what it's like to walk on eggshells around a loved one whose reactions are unpredictable and whose anger can flare up. I understand that's what life can be like for each of us at times. And the Jews lived in fear of Herod and they dared not challenge his reign. Instead, keeping the tenuous and uneasy peace was of greater value than seeking true peace, which would have required risk, courage, and, and support. And this is what I want to urge you to consider. That if you know the experience of living in the shadow of something within or someone without that is oppressive or fearing, then I would urge you to take a step to reach out and share your situation with a trusted friend, with skilled others who can support and guide you. You know the good news is there is a star that has risen. And that star lights the way to a Christ who gives God's grace in every way. And there is a community of Christ followers who are safe and can be trusted. And we encourage one another to, to demonstrate this kind of courage and risk to seek true peace, to live in light of what is true and no freedom in new measure. And I understand it takes courage, it takes tremendous risk and support. And God goes to such great lengths to shine the light of hope and love in a dark, dark world. It's amazing. It wasn't that the people living in darkness back then have seen a great light. It's today that the people, you and me, living in darkness have seen a great light. To us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. Isn't that great news? And I would just encourage you to step into the light of the truth of your situation with the grace and the support of Christ and a loving community and experience new freedom. Joel often says, God is bigger than our problems. Do we believe that? 
If we make our problems or allow them to become bigger than God, we've lost perspective and are likely living in fear. And that's a check for me on a regular basis to say, who am I trusting? Am I trusting self? Am I trusting others? Am I trusting God? And, and Paul says, look, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, he says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Christ who loved us. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ. But I know that there are many things that threaten to separate us from what is true and what is support. And I just want to encourage you that there is a star that has risen. He points to Christ. And, and, and be courageous. And you'll see that in the wise men's demonstration of following the star. It's really inspiring. I mean, these wise men were determined to seek. They were determined to seek. They went a thousand plus mile journey to seek out the, the, the light of Christ. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go, search carefully for the child. As soon as you find him, come report to me so that I too may go and worship him. It's all a ploy to hijack that information to take out the Christ child. But the wise men didn't know that. That's revealed to them later. And, and so they just trusted and were determined and they made the journey. They made the journey and they demonstrate for us essential elements to being a seeker determined to seek the light of Christ. They demonstrated this courage to seek, which is really powerful. After they had heard the king, they went on their way and the star they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. That's a really interesting verse to me, verse 10. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Well, well, why would that be? Haven't they seen the star for a thousand miles now on their way to Jerusalem? So why this exceeding great abundant joy now upon seeing the star? Well, they were part of what I think was a widespread expectancy in, the, in that part of the country that one would rise up to challenge the Romans and to push back the expanse and the, the sprawl of the Romans. And there was this widespread expectancy. It went far beyond Israel, well into Persia, that one would rise up who would be a ruler who would push back the expanse of Rome. And we know these wise men were part of that, but they were also seeking king of the Jews. Now, what to make of the star? I mean, you could make a lot of things about the star, but the scriptures say it was a star. I mean, that's what it says. So I, I don't know. I mean, there are a lot of theories, none of which shake my faith at all about God's story and truth. And I think many of them are valuable pursuits of understanding. Some of the theories include, you know, that it was a conjunction of planets. It was a nova. It was a supernova, an explosion of a star. It was a comet. Maybe it was an angel. However, God chose to reveal that light to those distant seekers, God did it. And uh, what is really amazing to me is why they were so overjoyed when the star appeared. You know, you and I think, well, hey, they're only like five miles. They, they've come a thousand. They only have five more to go. They can do it. You can do it, right? I think that when they saw the star and were exceedingly with great joy encouraged, it's because they were so disillusioned by the lack of expectancy in Jerusalem. So put it this way, have you ever had a great idea and you were so excited about that great idea and you floated that great idea out before your friends or your company and it was like a lead balloon? <laughs> it was like the water just got poured on any flame. All the air just sucked out of the room, right? Have you ever gotten to 24 miles and knew that you had another two point two to go and you're just about dead, right? Some of you know that. It's called the wall. You get 
almost to the top of Summit Avenue and whatever little bit you've got in you is about ready to come out and that's it. <laughs> And then you get to the top and you can see the capital and you can see the finish line and you, okay? They hit a point that I would describe as disillusionment, the wall. And the reappearance of the star was reason to hope. It was cause for exceeding great abundant joy because they were discouraged, I think. And I just want to suggest that in our faith journey of a thousand miles, disillusionment is a really important part of our experience. And it is a part of the Christian faith experience. In fact, I think at points we need to be disillusioned of certain ideas we have about why God exists as if he exists to make my life work well and go easier. Sometimes, though, we have experiences where we've been connecting with God in so many amazing ways. Every devotional is just like in high def, and, and we have God story after God story after God story, and then boom, it's like all the power shut off, the well dried up. I can't even imagine that my prayers are going higher, certainly not as high as this ceiling, not even higher than and I feel disconnected, and I can't put words to what is going on inside, but I know that there is a season of disillusionment and struggle that we all go through. And I want you to know a star still shines. And when it gets dark, that's when you start to see what is true light. They are disillusioned. And so when they see that light reappear, I mean, it's like, it's like wind in their sails. And they go on their way and they demonstrate the humility to worship. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These magi demonstrated the proper attitude and response in the presence of the king. Not one born to be king. No, this is king of the Jews. This is king and lord of all, and they recognized it. See, they weren't put off at all by the, the disguise, in a sense, of a little child. They knew this was king. And they weren't put off at all in their worship of this king based on the humility and, and uh, meagerness of the surroundings which this little family was dwelling in. Remember, Mary and Joseph had nothing. I mean, they were poor. They had nothing but each other, God, and the Christ child. They had everything, but they had nothing. And, and, you know, it's just a reminder that we don't need a lot to worship the Christ if we recognize he is king and Lord of all. You know, when we come together in this context, it is awesome. I mean, we have a feast of celebration and worship. And on tonight and Tuesday, we're going to have just an abundance of joy and celebration and all of which is great. But what is the nature of true worship? It's to recognize in the one who came that he is king and Lord of all, and we worship. And they worshiped, and they hoped. They hoped because they needed hope in order to endure what lie ahead. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. All right, now... They've come on a path that probably was marked out, previously traveled, on a map of some type, because at least Herod and the others would have known about the route that they came. And now they're told, you got to go back, but you got to go back a different route. And it's likely not on a map, and it's not been charted before. It's going to be difficult. And here I am thinking that the purpose of God was to make my life easier after I trusted him. I thought that after I came to encounter Christ, that, that my path going forward would be straighter and, and more easily marked out and successful. And lo and behold, I discovered that these wise men return a different route, 
likely a more difficult route. Not only that, Joseph is warned in a dream not to take the child to Jerusalem, but to escape to Egypt. And so they flee to Egypt. And I think following these examples, we ought not to expect that trusting God necessarily means that the path forward is always straight and easy. The path ahead was not only difficult for the Magi, for Mary and Joseph, but for those who are followers of Christ as well. And just a thought about the gifts that they gave. You know, we think about the gifts, the gold, the frankincense, and myrrh in symbolic terms. And I think that's appropriate. I think they represent the, 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 the gold who is, which is right and due to a king and the incense which is burned and goes up to worship the God that we worship and, and the myrrh which is prepared for one's burial. The body is prepared with myrrh. And so then over the years and, and centuries, we've attached a lot of symbolic significance to those because we know the end of the story that Christ is crucified and does rise again. And, but I would just say this. Peel back the layers of all of that tradition and symbolism and just think about the gifts that were given. Were they not given as God's provision for this very poor peasant family to then flee to Egypt and somehow make a way in the midst of a dark, dark world? I mean, is that not a picture of God's grace and provision? And you have stories, I bet, of how God has met you and provided for you in points where you just said, that is God's grace. And so these gifts are just wonderful gifts given to this young family who then find their way, I think, to live off that gift for the next several years while they're fleeing in a more difficult land. I would just say this. God has entrusted to you uh, an experience of his grace and his love and his hope and his joy that you and I are then to steward on behalf of a world in darkness. That you and I are called to be a voice of hope to people who continue to search and struggle and feel disconnected from God who desires to lavish his love and his grace and life upon them. Would we be a voice? Would we be a community of hope? Because what is required to keep hope alive, you know, hope is always held alive by a remnant. A remnant who see beyond the mystery to realize God is God. And God rises up and will provide in every circumstance if we'll trust him. You know, I used to think that I trusted when uh, my kids were about this size, you know, or maybe this size. And then they got to this size and I thought, wow, I'm doing a really great job at this parenting thing. I'm trusting God and doing so well. And, and then they got to be like this size and it was more challenging to, to kind of figure that out. And all Jerusalem in my household starts to tremble a little bit. And I'm thinking, wow, the, then they get to be my height and, and it's like then they're taller and now it's mano y mano and, and now I don't know that I know how to trust so well. I realized that what I was doing when they were like this or like this, or I was largely just shuffling them around, <laughs> kind of managing. You know, and it was easier to manage when they were underfoot or in my arms or, you know, at least they didn't have access to my car. <laughs> I could manage, but could I trust? <clears throat> and now I see that little one on the screen. And I think now I'm learning to trust. See, that's the journey of faith. Learning to trust. That in every circumstance, there is a star that points to the Christ who is hope of all. And I'm going to just end with this story because it is an awesome story. I think it's the cool story of the Christmas season for Westwood 2013. And you don't know this story, but I'm going to tell you this story because it's a story of a small group of high school boys in our midst who got after their small group leader and said, we want to do something that would be a blessing to others at Christmas. So what could we do? 
So they brainstormed this idea about they would go to the grocery store and, and then they thought, well, who are we gonna give the groceries to? So the leader got in touch with me and said, do you know anybody who might benefit from groceries? I got these guys who are after me and they wanna go grocery shopping. And so we made connections with a community agency and connected them up with four families. A single mom with uh, three boys, one family of seven, uh, the other family had five, and, and they were really needed. And they had four families, they were given four menus with specific items that these high school boys were to go to Cub, Cub Foods and, and buy. Maybe some of you were there on Wednesday and you saw this spectacle. <laughs> But I'm gonna just read the story of the, uh, the email that was sent to me by the leader. 10.30 that night, after it was all done, he writes me this email and he says, really cool night with our group. He said, these guys are quiet with their growth in faith, but tonight they showed it and it was contagious. We arrived at Cub and grabbed a few carts and started with the ham and instantly the boys were discouraged with the amount of money we had left after four hams. <laughs> Do these guys not realize that their parents have been forking out the money to feed them? What is the deal? <laughs> ham is expensive. And uh, the leader says, I think this set the tone for frugal and decisive shopping. <laughs> a lesson they'll need when they go off to college, he said. We split the total dollars we had into four families and carefully selected items that would fit their stomach. Their stomach, not ours. Way to be other-centered, guys. That was great. Some guys spent time with me looking up on their phones what Hispanic Christmas dinners looked like on Google. I mean, these guys in the aisles, they're trying to figure out, do I buy the, which type of rice and which type of bread? And We split the total. And here's where the blessing started. We maxed our carts out with the dollars we had and the boys looked at the carts and they weren't satisfied. We went around the group and hands started raising with extra money. Guys emptying out their wallets for extra ones and the average person went from $10 to $15 to sometimes $20. These guys got cash. <laughs> this is a well enhanced group. We again maxed out our carts and went to the registers. The total ended up being $60 shorter than we added up. Not quite sure how this happened since we tallied up every item pretty closely. We grabbed a whole other cart full of groceries and added it to the pile. This thing just keeps getting bigger. While checking out, a woman behind us then pitched in another $20. Even more groceries for these families. We ended up with a $200 plus dollar bill somehow paid for and four families ended up and then he has this whole long grocery list of items that they boxed up. Is that not a story of wise men who worshiped out of knowing God's grace and love in their own lives? Out of walking with Jesus, as they walk with Jesus, they desired to bless others. I just think that is an awesome story of wise men. And we would all, myself included, be wise to take their lead. Because you know what? God doesn't need our gifts. He doesn't need us to, to, to give him anything except our hearts, except our lives. The secret of giving is that as we give, we receive, right? It's not as if God needs us to give to him. He's the owner of everything. But as we give, we receive. And that's the story of Christmas. So let's uh, join together and pray. Father, we uh, are so grateful for your love and your grace and all the reminders of this season that speak to us again and again of the star and the light and the life which is in Jesus, your Son and our Savior. And as we celebrate together personally and as family and friends gather, might you be magnified, Lord Jesus, and might our hearts be again surrendered to you and used of blessing to others. And so be glorified in our gathering this evening and on Tuesday and beyond that as we worship Christ the Lord, we pray in his name. Amen. Well, let's stand together. I would just wish you God's blessing.
as you go and enjoy the uh, Christmas season.